in case you ever wondered the real reason dinosaurs became extinct. Our subject for this hour is dinosaurs, how they fit into the, uh, how they fit into Earth history. I've, I've talked to a lot of folks over, over time who are so convinced that dinosaurs and evolution are synonymous that since they know evolution is not right, then obviously dinosaurs didn't exist. A lot of Christians think that dinosaurs never existed. But dinosaurs did exist, and if they did exist, and if the Bible is correct, and of course both are true, then there must be some way to fit the concept of dinosaurs into the biblical model somehow. And that's what I'd like to do with you here this evening. We'll talk a little bit about dinosaurs, some of our favorite dinosaurs. Who's this guy? Triceratops. What is there interesting about Triceratops? Why is he of interest? Well, why do we, he's got those three horns sticking out the front. Tri, that means like tricycle or something. Three. Three horns sticking out the front. Triceratops. Very, one of the, one of the favorite dinosaurs. Who's this guy? Stegosaurus. What is there interesting about Stegosaurus? Well, he's got those real interesting plates along his back. You know, scientists are always arguing about Stegosaur. It used to be that they would draw him like this, but now dinosaur scientists, experts on dinosaur fossils, argue about whether or not Stegosaur had two rows of plates like this, one on either side, staggered up and down his spine, or maybe it was just one row of plates. And most scientists now are convinced that he had just one row of plates. As Ken Han would say, how do you know? Whoever saw a stegosaur, well, we do have fossils, and we can see how their fossil plates are arranged. Another interesting thing about stegosaur, I mean, this is one of the favorite fossils of all, right? Everybody knows about stegosaur. Did you know that in all of the world, well, several stegosaur fossils have been found? Don't get the impression we find tens of thousands of these fossils. Several stegosaurs have been found. In all of the world, in all of time, only one Stegosaur skull has ever been found. Hmm. So we sometimes, we don't know as much maybe as we'd like to, to make out. Here's a famous dinosaur. Brachiosaurus. Looks kind of like Brontosaurus. Brachiosaurus. Well, actually, some of these things are so much alike that it takes a real expert to, um, to, to check them out. I mean, to, to tell the difference. Brachiosaurus. Who's this guy? Brontosaurus. Actually, did you know that Brontosaurus, he never existed. Brontosaurus was a mistake. Now, I know Brontosaurus is your favorite dinosaur, but he never existed. I mean, Brontosaur was a mistake. Actually, what happened was, oh, a hundred or so years ago, when one of the famous dinosaur fossil hunters was, was hunting up these dinosaurs, he found some bones of a huge, huge creature. But the bones were, the, the, not all the bones were there. Well, <clears throat> a couple years later at a totally different site, he found a skull that looked like it was about the right size to fit this skeleton he had found over here that didn't have a skull. So he put that skull on that skeleton and put them both in the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. It's there to this day, standing up there, labeled Brontosaurus. But as it turns out, hmm, we found out that the body was really the body of a Patasaurus, and the head was the head of a Diplodocus. Brontosaurus was really a combination. It was really an Apatosaurus Diplodocus, depending on which end you're looking at. Here's a Diplodocus, and, and again, I, you know, I can't easily tell the difference. And I do study about these things. They're pretty much the same. Probably of the same kind that were created, with some var variation possible. You know, there's a lot of things that we think we know about dinosaurs that are not really known about dinosaurs. What kind of a dinosaur, what kind of an animal were dinosaurs? Were they mammals? Were they fish? Were they birds? Were they reptiles? Most people think they were reptiles. Did you know that a lot of dinosaur experts really argue were dinosaurs reptiles or not? We have a lot of reptiles around today, but we don't evidently have any dinosaurs around today. If dinosaurs were reptiles, they were a special kind category of reptile, and they evidently are extinct. But do we know that dinosaurs were reptiles? It, it, really, we don't. A lot of dinosaur experts argue that dinosaurs had hair like a mammal. Some even argue that they had feathers like a bird. I mean, I know that's not in the kids' books on dinosaurs, right? 
That's in the technical literature. That's where they argue. So, what do we know about dinosaurs? All we have to study about dinosaurs is bits and pieces of dead ones. And, well, reptiles are cold-blooded. They lay eggs. They have scales for skin. But do dinosaurs? We don't know, because all we have is bones. And they don't lay eggs. And they don't, you can't take their temperature, and they don't have skin. How do you know what these things were like? Well, I think that dinosaurs were probably reptiles. But, you know, all we've got is the bones. Well, if dinosaurs were reptiles, what's the difference between an ordinary reptile that's around today and dinosaur reptiles? Not just size. Some dinosaurs were small as small as modern reptiles, or even smaller than, than many modern reptiles. Some, some dinosaurs were no bigger than a chicken. Some dinosaurs were big, evidently. But the thing that makes an ordinary reptile, that, that differentiates between a dinosaur reptile and an ordinary reptile, is primary, par primarily his hip structure, his hip bone. All dinosaurs had one or the other of these kinds of hips. <clears throat> this is a hip that's called, that's the lizard hip dinosaur. And this is a bird hip dinosaur. Most of the four-legged dinosaurs that walked on four legs had what we call a lizard hip. Now, that's not totally all the time true. Tyrannosaurus rex had a lizard hip, and he walked on two feet, right? Some dinosaurs that walked on two legs had what we call a bird hip, bird hip dinosaurs. But not all of them, because Stegosaur had a bird hip, and he walked on four legs. So, but anyway, all dinosaurs either had a lizard hip or a bird hip, and here are their hips up here. Now, it's very important to recognize that modern-day lizards do not have lizard hips, and modern-day birds do not have bird hips. Only extinct reptiles had lizard hips or bird hips, extinct dinosaurs. Actually, the difference between a modern-day lizard's hip and a lizard hip is that dinosaurs, all of them, had an erect posture. They stood straight up, uh, maybe like on all fours like an elephant or a cow. They stood up with their legs underneath them, whereas modern reptiles all have their legs that come out on the side. You know, an alligator is walking with his legs out this way, and he walks around doing push-ups all day long. That's, that's a modern reptile. That's their modern hip. But uh, all dinosaurs had either a lizard hip or a bird hip. Very unusual. <clears throat> Again, there's a lot of things we don't know about dinosaurs, but we do know that at least some of them laid eggs. We do find in a few places dinosaur fossil eggs. Now, these are solid stone. When, an, when, a, when a, an organic piece of an animal or an egg or anything becomes fossilized, that organic material actually is totally replaced by stony material. It, it's actually stone in the shape of an egg. It's, the egg has been totally decayed and, and moved away by groundwater. But here we have a clutch of dinosaur eggs. And in fact, in, in a few of these cases, the preservation is so precise that even with x-ray technology, they can see inside this stone egg the stone remains of the dinosaur fetus and the little hatchling that didn't come out yet. And so we know that they're dinosaur eggs. Some of them are big. Some of them are big as a football, something like that. And they are dinosaur eggs. So at least we know that at least some of the dinosaurs laid eggs. We don't know that all of them lay eggs, laid eggs. Maybe they all did. Maybe we just don't know. We don't have any dinosaurs around today laying eggs. Some of the dinosaurs had scales for skin. They didn't have hair or feathers. On a few cases, we found dinosaur skin impressions in the rock and those that we found all had scales like reptiles. So there's some pretty good reason to think that the dinosaurs were reptiles, but we really just don't know for sure. There's just a lot of arguments, there's a lot of disagreement, a lot of very interesting things being proposed about dinosaurs these days. One of the ways that we learn some things about dinosaurs is through dinosaur fossil footprints. Footprints of dinosaurs. Here we go, left, right, left, right, left, right. In solid limestone solid hard rock. Now how does 
how were these prints made? Did a dinosaur rock, walk over a rock ledge and leave these footprints in the rock? Did he make a hole in the hard rock? Of course not. That's like if a dinosaur walked over your front sidewalk. He might bust it to smithereens, but he would not leave footprints, would he? A dinosaur would not make footprints in hard, solid rock. But if this was mud, he could make his footprints in the mud, and then later the mud could turn to stone and preserve the shape of the footprints. But uh, when they were made, it, it had to be soft mud. And in fact, I think these prints were made during Noah's flood. I think by and large, the dinosaurs pretty much died out in Noah's flood. But during that flood, you have this terrible water catastrophe going on all over, and in many places, you'd find layers of mud being laid down. And while the waters are building up the first few weeks of the flood, I'm sure many animals were still looking for some place of safety, some refuge from these rising floodwaters. And here in this case, a layer of mud was laid down. The dinosaur sees a layer and he walks across it, makes these footprints as he, as he runs across. And later, another layer comes in and fills in the footprints and, and preserves them. And then over the next hundred or two years, those that muddy uh, material uh, turned into solid rock. And the material that filled in the dinosaur footprint was a different sort of rock. And so it later was able to come out and separate the two. And, and now we find dinosaur tracks. We find them in many places, thousands of dinosaur tracks. This is a, a two-legged bird hip dinosaur, a trachodon. Here's an interesting dinosaur track. That's one of those lizard hip ones. That's uh, a brontosaur-like creature, but it couldn't be a brontosaur, of course, because brontosaurs never existed. <clears throat> but uh, this evidently was an acrocanthosaurus, so they say. Little Tommy there. I suspect Tommy was not there when the dinosaur made the footprint. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, a big footprint made by a big foot, no doubt. A lot of our studies of dinosaurs these days are reconstructing dinosaurs in ways that, that were not popular even 10, 15 years ago. There's a whole revolution in the understanding of dinosaurs. We used to think of dinosaurs as slow-moving, little, you know, just plodding along. Well, now, from a study of their tracks and study of their bones, dinosaur experts are, are proposing that at least many of the dinosaurs could run fast and jump like a frog, maybe, or like a kangaroo. Maybe so. But how do you know? How do you know? Whoever saw a dinosaur jump? Whoever saw a dinosaur waddle? Whoever saw a dinosaur do anything? All we have is bits and pieces of, of dead ones, and they don't jump, and they don't walk. And we can try to reconstruct the past, try to figure out what it was going on in the past that makes the present fossils look the way they do. But you understand the problem. We don't, we just can't know for sure. Here's a very interesting dinosaur fossil find. Very rare. The whole fossil is there together. Very interesting fossil. Very, very seldom do you find these many bones all in the same place and all still connected. I mean, and we know exactly now how this dinosaur was put together. But that's not usually the case when dinosaur fossils are find, found. Here's a dinosaur fossil find where there's a number of different dinosaurs, dinosaur bones together. And a whole mountain is just many, many dinosaur bones. And there they are. And... I tell you what, dinosaur fossil experts really have a tough job. I mean, when you find dinosaur fossils, you usually find, well, maybe you'll find ten bones, but they might be from five different dinosaurs, two bones from five different dinosaurs, and all you got is this stuff, and you say, huh, what in the world did this creature look like? That's a tough job. And dinosaur experts make mistakes all the time. Here's a famous dinosaur fossil find. The fossils that were found, as you can see, the, the lizard hip there, and a couple bones in the tail, and a couple ribs. The rest of this then was reconstructed, the, the scientist's best guess as to what the animal looked like. Now, was that right? Was it right? No. How do you know? Maybe it was. Actually, now we found these same bones in, in other dinosaurs that are more complete, and we know that it was not at all correct. It was a big mistake. 
But that's the way it is with dinosaur fossil finds and with, with fossils in general. You see, scientists are really in trouble about fossils. Fossils, while they may be remains of things that lived in the past, fossils exist in the present. They are here today. They are here. They are here. And, and scientists are here today. They exist in the present. We do all of our study in the present. We do all our fossil digging in the present. We do our historical reconstructions in the present. But fossils exist in the present and are just bits and pieces of dead things. And, well, we can reconstruct the past. We can try to imagine what that creature was like. But huh, when we're dealing with partial data and partial understanding, then there's a lot of room for, for error. Here's a typical dinosaur fossil find, where we find a pile of dinosaur bones, and the scientist goes out there, and he's an expert, right? And he studies those dinosaur fossils, and there they are. And he looks at those things, and he studies them, and he says, in my expert opinion, these dinosaurs were fighting just before they died. This one had a hold of that one's tail. That's his opinion about those dinosaur fossils. And maybe it's right. Maybe it is right. Well, but what he does, he goes into the museum and he tells the artist in the museum to paint a mural of his idea. You understand what's happening? You go into the museum, over here in the La Brea Tar Pits, or you go wherever, and there you see the mural and the, and the opinion of the scientist are on that mural. Whereas when you look at the fossils, usually they're just a, a pile of bits and pieces of dead things. And as it's seldom do you find the whole fossil there together, the whole creature there together. And all you know is that they were buried together. You don't know if they lived together. That You don't know if they bit one another's tail. The point that I would like to make this evening is that while opinions about, while, while certain experts may have opinions about dinosaur fossils or about fossils of any sort, when you're talking about the unobserved past, the long ago past, before anybody was there to see it, you're talking in the realm of opinion. And there may be more than one valid opinion. I'm here to tell you, as a creationist geologist, as a geologist who loves rocks and fossils and studies them all the time, I'm even I've even written a book about dinosaurs. I love dinosaur fossils. But dinosaur fossil experts make mistakes when we try to reconstruct the past. There are some opinions about dinosaur fossils that agree with Scripture. There are some opinions about dinosaur fossils that disagree with Scripture. And yet we have the same facts. We have the same fossils to study. Our whole thrust in, in the ICR and in these Back to Genesis seminars is to try to, to inculcate this concept of going back to Genesis, back to the Word of God, back to Scripture, back to truth and get our foundation there, get our worldview there, get our framework there, get the essence of what we think there, and then we can go to science and fill in some of the gaps maybe, but we use Scripture to interpret science. We don't ever allow science to tell us what Scripture is saying. And that is, I think, the proper way a Christian should think. And that's what we're trying to do with you here this weekend. As Christians, as Bible believers, we must make sure that our thinking in every area is grounded, founded squarely on the Word of God. And I'm also here to tell you that while my evolutionary colleagues have opinions about dinosaur fossils that are different than my opinion about dinosaur fossils that, that's based on Scripture, as Christians, we must come back to that Scripture as our foundation, and we must build our science from that perspective. I'm here to tell you that when you do that, when you build your creationist worldview, of science and history and life around you, when you think like a Christian, when you think like a Bible-believing Christian, then it's going to make an awful lot of sense of the world around you. Not only science and history, not only dinosaur fossils, but how you raise your kids and how you relate to society at, at large. Scripture gives us the foundation. The evolutionist will use this as his foundation. This is the evolutionist Bible by and large. This is what's called the geologic time scale. It's, a, it's a, um, a philosophical construct, you might say. And the idea is that the fossils record the evolution of, of life from the simple, the long ago past, 
uh, simple organisms evolved over time into more and more complex and finally into, into mammals and man up here in the present. The idea is if you start up here at the surface and you dig down, you'll come to fossils that are modern, modern things, Coke bottles, things like that. But you go on down farther and you'll get into um, mammoths and you go on down farther and you'll get into dinosaurs and go on down below, below that and you're getting into life that was here before dinosaurs even evolved. This is a time scale going from the present down to the long ago past. Did you ever wonder how scientists determine how old a fossil is? If you come up with a fossil, if you find a fossil out here somewhere, and you take it over here to the university, take it to a geology professor and say, tell me, sir, how old is this fossil? There is nothing about that fossil that can tell him how old that thing is. How old does a rock look? What does, how, what does a rock look like if it's a billion years old? What does a million-year-old rock look like? What does a hundred-million-year-old rock look like? What does a thousand-year-old rock look like? It looks like a rock, for crying out loud. You can't tell the difference. The geologist will then look at what fossils are in that rock, and then he'll go to his textbooks, and he'll look up and down until he finds that particular fossil, and he say, oh, my goodness, that fossil, that organism lived during the Permian era, the Permian period, and that was over 300 million years ago. So your rock is 300 million years old. That's how you date a rock. It's by the assumption of evolution. It's not by radiometric dating schemes. Tomorrow, Dr. Steve Austin's going to tell you some about radiometric dating schemes and, and why they are not to be uh, trusted implicitly. But uh, the idea is, in evolutionary thinking, that dinosaurs lived during the Mesozoic era from 65 to 250 million years ago. And they died out some 65 million years ago, long before man was around. And so, well, man didn't live at the time of dinosaurs. And, and well, that's, that's the evolutionist understanding of things. But the Bible says something very different. And here's where we must get our understanding of things. The Bible says that God created everything that there is in six days. He created the forefathers of the dinosaurs, or he created the dinosaurs, on one of the six days of creation. Ken Ham has already talked about that, how that on day six, God created the land animals. The Bible says very specifically that God created everything in six days. In six days. Evolution says that the dinosaurs lived millions of years ago and died out before man got here. The Bible says that God created everything. He made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. And it's precisely over this point that the evolution model and the creation model differ in the most serious point. Where do the fossils fit in? How do you explain all of these fossils? The Bible seems to say, if you let the Bible do the talking, the Bible seems to say that when Adam and Eve were created, all of the animals were created to be vegetarian, to evidently live forever. The Bible says it wasn't until man rebelled against God's created order. It wasn't until man sinned that death came into the universe. The Bible says that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. By man came sin and by sin came death. That's the biblical picture. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's the biblical picture. Man brought death, and not just spiritual death, as some have said, but definitely uh, physical death, certainly in 1 Corinthians 15. That's the resurrection chapter, the resurrection from the dead. The Bible says that by man came death. There was no death, evidently, before man sinned. And as I say, it's precisely over that point that the creation model and the evolution model differ in the most serious way. The Bible says that man's rebellion brought death. And evidently, animal death, all death, came as a result of Adam's sin and God's curse on all of creation. But evolution says that death has brought about man, that death is good, that death brought man. Do you see the difference? The Bible says by man's sin brought death. Evolution says death is good, death is normal, death is the natural uh, state of affairs. Struggle for existence, survival of the fittest. It was the extinction of the dinosaurs that allowed the mammals to take root and to grow and to flourish. And, and finally came along man. Death brought man, according to evolution. If you don't believe my words, 
Look at Charles Darwin. This is the last paragraph of Charles Darwin's book, Origin of Species, the conclusion of his whole treatise. He says, thus, from all of these written before, from the war of nature, from the struggle for existence, for sur survival of the fittest, from famine and death, from death, the most exalted object of which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, that's man, directly follows. Charles Darwin's conclusion was, by death came man. That's evolution. Carl Sagan, the great atheist, he says it this way. He says, the secrets of evolution are death and time. Death and time. Christians, we can't be playing around with this. Death, if it was here before man, as Ken Ham says, it destroys the very foundation of the gospel, the work of the cross. See, the Bible says that it was death, that death was brought about by man's sin and the resultant curse that was placed on all of creation. But you see, if evolution is correct and death has been around here for millions of years before mankind ever got here, before Adam and Eve ever sinned, if death was normal, if death is natural, if death is the stuff that all the things are made of, then death is not the wages of sin. If death is not the penalty for sin, then what in the world did Christ's death do? If it did not pay the penalty for sin, then, as Paul says, we are of all men most miserable. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. You see how it undermines the foundation of the gospel. If death is not the penalty for sin, then Jesus Christ's death did not pay that penalty as a substitute for you and me. Here's a very interesting quote from a leading atheist written in the journal American Atheist a couple years back, ten years ago. I'm afraid some of my evolutionary colleagues understand this issue of death before sin and how that fits in with the creation evolution controversy better than many of my Christian friends. Let me read this quote. And as I read this quote, keep in mind this is a difficult quote even to read, but it goes like this. He says in his article entitled The Meaning of Evolution, he says this, that Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution because, he said, evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin. In other words, put death before Adam and Eve's sin. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble, in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of his death. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. Evolution means that Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins. Many Christians tell me that this issue is unimportant. Folks, this is an important issue. It is perhaps the most important issue. We need to be informed on it. We need to be aware of it, inoculated against it. Our children must be taught its error because it is an error. But let's go back to the scriptures and see about dinosaurs. When did God create dinosaurs? On day five, God was creating animals for the ocean. He was creating oceanic animals and, and birds. But on, on day five, in chapter one, verse 21 of Genesis, it talks about God creating great, in the King James it says great whales. In uh, other translations it says great sea monsters or sea creatures. God created great sea monsters or dragons. Actually the word in Hebrew there is the word for dragons used elsewhere in scripture, translated dragons. God created great dragons. Now you're saying this guy really has flipped his cork. <laughs> Coming here talking about dinosaurs in the Bible, now he's going to talk about dragons? Well, yeah, I am. You know, did you ever stop to think about dragons? Who in the world were the dragons? Almost every culture around the world have legends of dragons. And they, you know, they describe these beasts as huge, horrible, reptilian-sounding beasts with prickly spines and long tails and long necks and, you know, breathing fire and locking princesses and towers and things like that. But it appears to me that these legends of dragons might just be the faded memories of humans' encounters with dinosaurs. You know, and they've been told and retold over the years. I guarantee you that if, if I encountered a dinosaur, huh, you know, I'd tell my kid about it, right? I mean, hey, son, let me tell you what happened to me. And, you know, even if he never saw a dinosaur, 
he would tell his kids, hey, let me tell you what my daddy told me, and it would, let me tell you what my granddaddy told my great-granddaddy, or however that works. And it would get bigger and better maybe as the years went on, but uh, I think these legends of dragons might just be the faded memories of, of, of dinosaurs. Oh, and on, then on day six, God created land animals. Actually, oceanic reptiles are not dinosaurs. Like plesiosaurs, they're not dinosaurs. You know why? Because they had flippers. They didn't have legs. They didn't have lizard hips or bird hips. They were marine reptiles, giant marine reptiles that are thought to have lived during the age of the dinosaurs. Of course, we don't believe in the age of the dinosaurs, but um, oceanic reptiles, great sea dragons. But then on day six, God created land animals animals, including the beast of the earth, that's large animals, the cattle, that's the domesticated animals like cow and sheep and goats, and, and then the creeping things, that's small animals. Everything was created on, on one of those um, two days, all animals. But as has been mentioned, the Bible specifically says that all animals, when they were created, were to be plant eaters. They were not to be meat eaters. The Bible says, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything, that creeps upon the earth in which there is life to everything. I've given them every green herb for food. That's vegetation, plants. Well, we have pictures of dinosaurs, don't we, of being horrible meat eaters. I mean, yeah. What about Tyrannosaur? Am I going to try to tell you that Tyrannosaur ate plants? Well, did Tyrannosaur eat meat? How do you know? Were you there? Who ever saw Tyrannosaur eat anything? All we know is that the Bible says that when God created animal life, they were to eat only plants. Now, it may very well be that dinosaurs ate meat. You know why we think that dinosaurs ate meat? Particularly Tyrannosaur. Their teeth. And some of their teeth look like they ate meat. But did these, did they, are these are dinosaur teeth, these are dinosaur fossil teeth. Do they eat meat? They don't eat anything. They just sit there. They don't eat anything. <laughs> Maybe they ate meat. I suspect they did eat meat. I suspect they did. The Bible tells us, though, that when God created, all animals would eat plants. Now, what happened after creation to change things sin adam and eve rebelled against god god's created order and god came down and he cursed all of creation and he cursed things in a way that changed creation from that point on the bible says that god will come back one day and restore things so he will bring creation to fruition to make it like he wanted it in the first place but at the time of the curse, creation was changed. God changed plants, did he not? From now on, thorns and thistles are going to come forth. He changed Eve's body. From now on, it was going to be difficult to bear children. He changed the snake's body structure. From now on, you're going to crawl on the ground. It wouldn't surprise me if he didn't change a lot of the animals to give them these offensive and defensive characteristics. But I, we're just speculating there. Don't know. All we do know is that when they were created, when the animals were created, they were created to eat plants. And maybe the dinosaurs came later. You know, maybe they were mutations. Maybe he changed them somewhat. Maybe he did some genetic manipulation. We just don't know. But all we do know is that before very long, just ten generations later, the Bible says that the world was so violent that God promised to judge it. God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. I think primarily human violence, but maybe animal violence, maybe dinosaurs, maybe all sorts of violence. Just the earth was just so filled with it, God had to destroy the earth. He says, I will destroy all these living things with the earth. God destroyed the earth because of sin and death and bloodshed and violence. So he told Noah to build an ark build an ark and bring on board two of every kind of animal. And God sent the flood and all that was on the dry land died. Everything that lived outside the 
that was that lived on the dry land. It says, in whose nostrils was the breath of life. That doesn't include fish and starfish, things like that. But land-dwelling, air-breathing animals either were on board the ark or they died. Only Noah and those who were with him in board the ark remained alive. Question is, um, hmm, dinosaurs lived on board Noah uh, on um, you know before the flood. Did they go on board Noah's ark? Well, don't know. I think so. The Bible says take two of every kind of animal on board the ark. And they did live on land, and I suspect they were on board the ark. Now, it may, may not have been much fun on board Noah's ark. <laughs> but I'll promise you one thing. It was more fun on board Noah's ark than it was outside the ark. Because out there, everything died. Noah's flood was God's judgment of that sinful world. Don't think of Noah's flood as a, as a ride on a houseboat. You know, you see the pictures of the, of the houseboat with the animals and the giraffe sticking its neck out, you know. Don't think of Noah's flood like that. Tomorrow night when you see Steve Austin talk about Mount St. Helens, that incredible catastrophe was a dinky little volcano. And it is a clue as to what Noah's flood may have been like, but it was just an unthinkable catastrophe. Mount St. Helens expands our imagination to try to imagine what Noah's flood was like, but that was an awful time. I think of Noah's flood this way. I think of 500-foot walls of water, tsunamis. I think of mud flows, like is racing down off the side of Mount St. Helens. You'll see tomorrow night at 90 miles an hour. Think of Noah's flood that way, and you're in the ballpark. Think of Noah's flood that way. Noah's flood was God's hatred for sin expressed. God is a righteous God. The wages of sin is death. God is not the sort of God that will allow sin to go unpunished. God hates sin. God judges sin. God sent Noah's flood as a judgment for sin. And everything outside the ark died. You might wonder, how did all the dinosaurs get on board Noah's ark? Well, you know, I wasn't there. I can't tell you. But I do know some things about reptiles that maybe give us a clue. There have been about a thousand different species of dinosaur fossils found. Just a thousand. Don't think millions and millions of dinosaur fossils. Think a thousand. A thousand different species of dinosaur. And most of those species are really like they'll find one little piece of a rib bone in China and a little piece of a, of a, of a toe bone in Texas. And, a, and that's the kind of thing they usually find. And they build these huge models out of this stuff. Occasionally, they'll find a, a, a total skeleton. So, I mean, it's not totally imaginary. But, uh, you know, how do you know that these thousand different species were different kinds? And did, dino, did, did Noah have to take 2,000 dinosaurs on board the ark? I think not. If you look at all those things and you boil them down, we've tried to do this. And, and I, would, I would venture a guess that probably there were less than 50 different kinds of dinosaurs, maybe just 10 or so different kinds of dinosaurs. If you put... Apatosaurus and Diplodocus and, and Brachiosaurus maybe in one kind. You see, you bring the number way down. And you don't have to take these thousands of different kinds. And it's also important to know that you wouldn't have to take the biggest Brachiosaur you could find. Actually, if dinosaurs were reptiles, and it appears that they were, if dinosaurs were reptiles, then maybe they had the physiology of modern-day reptiles. Modern reptiles particularly the larger ones, continue to grow as long as they live. They grow bigger and bigger. The, the biggest Galapagos sea turtle that you'll see over here at Knott's Berry Farm is the oldest Galapagos sea turtle. They grow bigger and bigger every year. Well, before the flood, you remember the Bible says that humans lived a thousand years or so, and, and reptiles typically outlive people. The, the large ones do. There are reptiles that are several hundred years old today. It may be that the dinosaurs also lived over a thousand years. And if you take an animal that keeps growing huh, and let him live for a thousand years, he's going to be big, right? Noah didn't have to take the biggest brachiosaur he could find. You know, if he had to take the biggest one, the, the ark would fill up pretty fast. The ark was pretty big, but it'd fill up pretty fast. But maybe he took a teenager dinosaur rather than a thousand-year-old one. He wouldn't want to take the oldest one because the purpose of the ark was salvation, was, was safety and reproduction afterwards. So you wouldn't want to take the granddaddy. He couldn't have babies afterwards, right? You'd want to take a young, strong, virile one that was able to survive the rigors of the trip and, and reproduce afterwards. 
So you take small, maybe a brontosaur-like creature the size of a cow. There's plenty of room on board Noah's Ark for that. The biblical story makes sense. It works. It makes sense out of the evidence. And then, of course, there is evidence that dinosaurs lived after the flood. Most of the dinosaurs died in the flood. Just these representatives on board the ark survived. But then there is evidence that they lived after the flood. In the book of Job, for instance, this will be your homework assignment for tonight. Go home and read Job chapter 40, starting at verse 15. God is speaking there to Job, and he's pointing out various things in the creation. And he says to Job, Behold, Job, behold a creature named Behemoth. Then it goes on to describe Behemoth, and it describes it like this. And it was an animal that Job evidently was at least familiar with. Job lived right after the flood. He lived about the time of Abraham or maybe even sooner. And so if some of the dinosaurs survived the flood, it would be likely that they would live in Job's day more than any other day. And Job seemed to know about dinosaurs. Job chapter 40 talks about a great creature like this. And then Job chapter 41 talks about an animal that lived in the ocean called Leviathan that at least sometimes came out on land. And that creature could even breathe fire. Dr. Gish, in his book, Dinosaurs, Those Terrible Lizards, speculates about how dinosaurs may have had a... Some of the dinosaurs may have had a bony structure on top of their head. Scientists don't know what that is. He speculates maybe that was a chemical storage area that contained and produced chemicals that, when exposed to oxygen in the air, would flash into, into flame. It's very possible. But, you know, we really don't know because what we have is skull bones and they don't breathe fire. So we don't know. The Bible says some kind of an animal could breathe fire. And maybe that makes sense of some of these legends of fire-breathing dragons. Well, there's other evidence that dinosaurs lived at the same time of man. There's cave drawings of, of some kind of creature in the Grand Canyon. I, I'm not going to tell you that that's a dinosaur. Maybe it is. I just don't know. You with me? Um, but along this same cliff uh, are carved many other animals that are recognizable, like buffalo and, and mammoth, things like that. And then there's that thing. Maybe. Maybe it is. There's also this thing there. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you that's a dinosaur. But um, don't know what else it could be. Nobody knows what else it could be. I think one of the very strong evidences that man lived at the same time a dinosaur is, is in those legends of dragons. Those things, many of them have the ring of truth about them. On the table out there is a is a, uh, a video that you can purchase called Di the, the Great Dinosaur Mystery. Actually, the book, The Great Dinosaur Mystery, has a lot of this in it also. But in that video and in that uh, book are documented many of these what appear to be sober accounts of, of dragons and, and re reputable people describing them. All those legends of, of Sir George killing the dragon, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff like that. Of course, sailors are always talking about dragons. Here's a dragon. I mean, these are just in, in just recent hundred years or so, the, the, the dragons of the ocean attacking ships. There's one. Here's this, this dragon chewing on that fella. Here we are out there on uh, Seal Beach out here. And, and, you know, hundred years ago, you see the bathing suits. Up comes Puff. Remember Puff? These are not long ago sorts of things. These are modern day sorts of things. And, and of course, you know, everybody wants to know about Loch Ness Monster. I want to know about Loch Ness Monster. I sure wish I'd hurry up and find that thing and figure out what it was. Many scientists are convinced that the thing is probably a, uh, a plesiosaur. Somehow survived for 60 million years in the ocean. Actually, to find a living dinosaur would not disprove evolution, but it would sure give him a black eye. Oh, my. It would be fun to watch him tap dance around it. Oh, it'd be fun. <clears throat> Here's a very interesting discovery. This was a Japanese fishing vessel just 10 years or so ago off the coast of New Zealand. They were fishing in their nets, and they brought up their nets, and, oh, my goodness, there was something in the net that they didn't recognize. It's a huge creature. 
A couple years ago, I talked to a fellow who lived in New Zealand at the port where this Japanese fishing vessel came um, and, and docked, and some of these sailors came on board. He, he talked to them. They talked about this thing out there on their ship, this thing that looked like a plesiosaur. I mean, it looked like it, and it was a rotting carcass of something that had died just a week or two before. Well, they took some pictures of it. it, as, it as it turned out, it, it stunk so bad, those sailors were saying that they couldn't even get on board without vomiting. It smelled so bad. It was a rotting carcass. But finally, they threw it overboard just to get rid of it, to save their catch of fish. Well, they got back to Japan and showed the pictures to the scientists there, and everybody says, oh, for crying out loud, that's the last living plesiosaur. They went back out with a thousand ships, tried to find this, this thing. Well, of course, the ocean's a big place, and they never did find it. But the Japanese even published a commemorative stamp the plesiosaur that had been found. Now, many evolutionists now will, will, um, will poo-poo that, but in reality, they took a sample of the flesh, and the sample of the flesh was compatible with reptile flesh. It was not diagnostic, but it was compatible with it. The shape looks like could be a plesiosaur. Well, don't know. I wish we'd find out things for sure, but there are still even now undocumented un um, stories from rainforest here and there of, of, of encounters with living dinosaurs even now. The pygmies in Africa in particular, in, in the very central Af Africa and Congo, are forever talking about a dinosaur that they encounter. They have a name for him. They call him Mukili Mumbimbe. And they're scared to death of Mukili Mumbimbe. They, they draw pictures of him like this, a small sauropod. I have a friend, a scientist, he worked up here at Jet Propulsion Lab when he did this expedition. He went down to the Congo to actually uh, see if he could find that thing. And it was a terrible adventure. The, the story he told was just, was just incredible. By the time they got back into this interior lake, it was in a swamp, and they had to wade through about 30 miles of swamp after weeks of trekking through the jungle. And by that time, they had lost all their cameras. Uh, their cameras had gotten moldy, and their film was ruined, and they had no ability to take a picture anymore. But he tells me that on seven different occasions, he saw the creature, a creature like this. And uh, he said it was gray, green thing, swimming in the lake primarily. He saw it seven different times. In fact, one time they were out on the lake in a raft. They had gotten in one of the things that they had been able to get back in there was a rubber raft that they blew up and were out there on the raft just hoping to see the creature again. And, you know, just out there all day long, about half asleep. And all of a sudden, the head of this thing poked its way up just 10 feet or so away, just right there, hmm. looking the other way. Now, what would you do if you were sitting there in a rubber raft and this head comes up out? I mean, you'd do what they did. <laughs> That's what you'd do. That's what they did. And, and, of course, they made, you know, they made so much noise, the thing turned around and looked at them, and I guess it was as scared of them as they were of it, and it went, went right back down. They never saw it again. But as a matter, as it turned out, later that very same night, um, see, they had, they, this was a swamp. They had built kind of a platform between the roots of the trees and, and were living on this, this wooden platform. And late that night, in the middle of the jungle with a lot of jungle noise, crickets, birds, a lot of noise, they heard a roar of some kind of creature that they had never heard before. A terrible roar and crashing, thrashing through the trees. Well, the, uh, the one piece of equipment they still had was a tape recorder, and they tape recorded this roar. It was a, as a different roar than they had ever heard before. And as a matter of fact, when they got back to civilization and had that roar analyzed, they were able to... Uh, distinguish that roar from other roars. You see, every kind of an animal has a different kind of noise. A dog is, sounds different than a cat, right? And, and you can run what's called a voice print analysis on each roar. This is the roar voice print of the creature, the unknown creature. And here we have an elephant. You see, an elephant is very different from the creature. And here's a gorilla. Here's a hippopotamus and a and a wildebeest, and a rhinoceros. Every creature is different from that. They, they, they compared it to, to every other large animal in the jungle, and it was totally unknown. It's the unknown creature. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you that that was a dinosaur. I've heard the tape, and it's, it's frightening to hear. It's very different from anything I've ever heard, but as of yet, it's still the unknown creature. They said they saw it, and it looked very much like a sauropod. I don't know. I guess, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I wouldn't believe it hardly, that it's a dinosaur until they captured it. And, and there are some expeditions going back down, hopefully within a year or so. There's a civil war down there, and it's difficult to get permits to go in. But, uh, you know, maybe they'll bring it back and put it in the San Diego Zoo. That's what I want to see. 
Maybe they'd put it in the Los Angeles Zoo and it'd probably get out and you know what happened. <laughs> the point of all this is that when you go to a museum and you see the museum skeletons, you see the exhibits of dinosaurs, and you listen to the tape recording of the explanation of these creatures and what you're listening to there and what you see in that mural is an opinion about these facts. Creationists have the same facts as the evolutionists. There are opinions about those facts that agree with Scripture. There are opinions about those facts that disagree with Scripture. As Christians, we must make sure that our whole thinking is founded, grounded on the Word of God in every respect. And when we do that, we find that the facts fit, that they all fit. It makes sense out of the world around us. This is a wonderful time to be a Christian, a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian, because all the evidence, it not only fits our model, it fits our model so much better than it fits any other model. There is no reason any longer for someone to try to distort Scripture with evolution, to try to accommodate evolution to Scripture. The Bible's true. It's been true all along. It's been true just as it's written. God's Word is true. We can stake our science on it. We can stake our history on it. We can trust it with our children. We can trust our eternal destiny to it. And that's the message of this seminar. Let's go back to Genesis and make our thinking fit Scripture. You've been a very patient audience. Uh, God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>